Imagine a perfect world where you can build a restaurant, open the doors, and make loads of money. Unfortunately, those days are over. It takes great leadership, hard work, and long hours to operate a successful restaurant. Together, we can make it happen. This is Restaurantopia. Welcome back to Restaurantopia. We got a great uh, podcast today on something that's near and dear to my heart and Anthony, uh, but something really special about this is just the dynamic duo. No Dave Ross today. So I got Anthony Hamilton, myself, Brian Seitz, and we're going to talk about menu engineering. Uh, Anthony, take it away. I'm so yeah. excited about today's episode. Yeah, me too. I think this is a, a very tactical and relevant approach, especially this day and age. I mean, look, it's always relevant to, to be savvy with menu engineering, um, but now's the time. And we've talked about trends. We talked about shrinking menus and Operators have to be very, very selective on, on what menu items to keep and what menu items to get rid of, right? It's because they have limited staff and, and limited business. And then the, the uptick in delivery too poses another threat because now you got to play with your gross profit a little bit because you got to pay the third party fees if you're not delivering yourself. So to me, menu engineering is one of those things that, that should be always prevalent, but now it should be prevalent in all caps, right? That's how I feel about it. So more than happy to run through this. I think we can simplify it a little bit and offer some resources on the back end to help operators really make a, a, a more pragmatic or take a more pragmatic approach to engineering their menu and, and being successful and more profitable, you know, especially again, during this time, because as you know, it's, it's, it's way different now, way different now. I can't wait. This is going to be fun. <laughs> You know, the, say goodbye to the seven page menu and we're, you know, everyone's yeah, down to yeah. a one pager. It's printed uh, on a yeah. copy machine and, you know, so it's, it's just new world. So let's, let's dive right in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, let's talk about what menu engineering is. It sounds like a scary word, right? You think, oh, engineering, everything's technical and, and you have to have, you know, a six year degree to do it. It's not. It, this is engineering in its simplest form. Essentially, what we're trying to do is we want to adjust the menu content based on popularity and profitability. Typically speaking, restaurants will just look at their sales mix, Brian, and they'll say, I only sold 12 salads this month. Let's just get it off the menu and replace it with something else. Yeah. And in my opinion, it's only one dimension. You know, great, your dish isn't popular, but did we dive in to find out why it's not popular? And that's what we'll get into. And then the other side is, is the placement of your items on your menu. That's the second tier of, of engineering is there's tricks, psychological tricks to where you put things on a menu to encourage guests to order them. And then we'll go over the golden triangle and some of the psychology behind it. I, I'm no psychologist, so I won't dive in too deep into that part. Um, but we do have some resources that, that can help guide with a little research. Operators can feel real, real good. And my general rule with this, though, stick to the basics. Don't dive too deep. It's a rabbit hole. You'll get trapped. There's a few basic rules to follow that have proven to be very, very successful. That's what I would stick with. So do it, test it, you know, you don't have to have a, an MBA in this to know that, it, you know, if you don't do anything, you're going to have zero results. Yeah, that's it. And, and I had a no fear shirt back in eighth grade. It said you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? You remember no fear? I, I do remember no yeah. fear. You do have to have a couple things in place to do proper menu engineering. And the first and foremost, you have to have your menu costed out. And if you don't have your menu costed out, what are you waiting for? Go <laughs> cost out your menu. There's no better way to keep your fingers on the pulse of your business and understanding your menu costs and how they affect your profitability. But it seems obvious, right? But in any business, I need to know my cost of goods sold. I need to know my profit per item. That way I can gauge my business. There's some reason in restaurants that, that always escapes us. And I'm not sure why. And I've been guilty of that too. Um, I, I don't get it. And, and, but now I'm, I'm saying profoundly, we should, we should definitely be costing out our menus, right? Like let's, no excuses, no exceptions, no deviations, cost out your menu. Um, without that data, you can't proceed in the menu engineering process, unfortunately. So that's, that's the first step. Once you have your menu costed out though, it's pretty easy. The, the upkeep on it is, is tremendously easy. The, the initial part is, is a little tumultuous and, and tedious and all that. And you could occupy a full week's time, but um, once you have it done, the upkeep is, is simplistic and, and really low impact. So please, 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 let's start there. And then you got to work from a, a spreadsheet that I have and we'll provide in the show notes. And it's, it's a menu, menu engineering spreadsheet. And, and what's cool about it is it does all the work for you. So if you can put in your sales price, you can put in your cost of goods sold, meaning your menu item cost, and you can put in the, the number of them you sold, then you're good to go. And the spreadsheet generates the data that you need. What I love about this, Brian, is data doesn't lie, nor is data emotional. And that's, that's what I love because, listen, my grandma's meatloaf was an amazing recipe had it on my menu multiple times. It doesn't mean it's profitable or popular, but I don't take it off because I love my grandma, so I love that meatloaf. That's an emotional decision. Mm -hmm. um, in business, when emotion goes up, intelligence goes down, right? You know it as well as anybody. 
Um, and, and I tend to, I tend to think that, that we rely on emotion a little too much. So this is an opportunity to really exercise some black and white data to make your decisions, much like your corporate competitors do, as, as we've talked before, and they tend to succeed you know, having this kind of model. Don't get me wrong, don't eliminate all emotion from the independent operator because that's part of what makes them magical. But when it comes to the business decisions, try to eliminate as much as you possibly can. I'm very much black and white and, and try to leave out the gray when it comes to the numbers and, and things of that nature. So we'll run through this spreadsheet in just a second, but I wanted to talk about the quadrants. And, and this is across any industry. If you've ever seen this before, and I could probably share it now. Yeah, can you share, share it? I think that'd yeah. be awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if, you're, if you're listening to this on, on the podcast, we can also find it on YouTube on our channel there on Restaurantopia. So, so this is a quadrant that, that I would make all my, my decisions based on when it comes to menu changes and understanding what I need to keep and, and what I need to get rid of. And I'm going to run you through this real quick. Again, this has been very popular in many industries and we've kind of adopted in hospitality. You can see the axes here. You have profitability going this way and you have popularity going this way. Mm -hmm. It's no surprise that the pinnacle of both popularity and profitability, you have what's called the stars. I mean, inappropriately named. These are your all-star dishes. Not only are they popular, but they generate a ton of gross profit for your bottom line. So they're amazing to have. Over here, you have your plow horses. You can see they're very popular, but they're on the low side of profitability. These are your cheeseburgers and you know, other, other items. I think sandwiches all the time for whatever reason, but cheeseburgers like the pinnacle of it. These drive a lot of your foundational costs as far as they always say that plow horses pay the bills. And, you know, look, I mean, you'd rather have everything be a star, but plow horses are the second best of star, meaning they're popular to generate a reasonable profitability. They're pretty good. And, and these generally are the most popular items on your menu. Down here, you have the puzzles. You can see that they're high profitability, but low popularity. These dishes look nice on paper. They look like they're going to be a home run. Obviously, the gross profits there. It's amazing. But for some reason, people are just not ordering them. So these ones, you kind of want to tweak. You want to figure out the puzzle or solve the puzzle to get them up into the star category. And essentially, you want to gravitate or you want to have everything migrate towards this part of the graph and become a star. That's the ultimate goal for every operator, at least it should be. And then down in the bottom left, you have the dogs. Um, the dogs are neither popular nor profitable. We have a lot of dogs on our menus across, across the industry, I assure you, and we won't get rid of them like my grandma's meatloaf, for instance. I loved it, but everybody else thought it sucked. <laughs> um, and you know, look, that's an emotional decision. And, and I kept it on my menu because I wanted to honor my grandma and my grandma would have came out of her grave and slapped me in the face and said, don't be stupid in business. My meatloaf wasn't that good. You can honor me in other ways. It's so, okay, grandma, no problems. But this quadrant is what I, what I do everything on and it's simplistic and, and it's an animation, but it's, it's so valuable. When I put this information into the spreadsheet here in a couple of minutes, you're going to see on the spreadsheet, it's going to generate a name for each of the menu items I put in. When it comes to dogs, I almost drop these automatically. When, when my spreadsheet says this dish is a dog, I, I'm probably just going to get rid of it without thinking too much through it. Um, and, and that's kind of the luxury of this is it, the data is telling you it's not popular. It's not profitable. Why are you keeping it around? What's it doing for you? Yeah. And, and, and sometimes I think you have to really look at the dish too. So if it's your, say it's a, uh, an appetizer like calamari or something, are you, are you not executing on the calamari? Is, is it really just the, the quality of the, the food, uh, the, the, the quality of the presentation, it, you know, everything that goes into presenting a dish to a customer, but is that the issue? So again, you can revisit that. And I think you still need to do that analysis with the stars and all the other ones too, because you want to know why those things are successful. Yeah. Uh, so you can pattern them, right? That's actually a great point. What's funny about the dogs too, Brian, is, is sometimes you have a menu item on your menu that's been there for so long is that your service staff forgets to be excited about it. It becomes mundane to them. It's almost like they think that the guests should know about it. So they don't spend time talking about it. And, and from an operator standpoint, a lot of times, if I have that calamari dish that you're talking about, maybe it is or is not executed as, as much as you know, it should be or as well as it should be. I do the analysis. But then I kind of retrain my staff. Every now and again, I throw out a couple dishes for them to taste and reinvigorate their taste buds and get them excited about it again because nothing sells better than something top of mind that they buy into. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's an important notion there. Sometimes these things fall off the radar. You got to actually push them back out. You know, Make sure you, you uh, share the love with your staff because, again, if they're not excited about it, they're not going to sell it, plain and simple. I love that. Yeah, I know. It's cool. Um, all right. So we're going to move over to the spreadsheet. I'm going to run you through this real quick because it's, uh, it, it's pretty rad. And I didn't develop this. I had developed these on my own, but I found a better one. So I went ahead and just used it. And then again, we'll share this for sure. 
So this sheet over here, you can tell, I'm gonna move over to the blank one. All we have to do is put in our menu item names right here. We gotta put in our number sold, which we get from our sales mix and our POS. Mm -hmm. The food cost in the item, and then the item sell price. And then the spreadsheet does the rest. So we need four points of data, one of which is the name. So I've drummed up a couple examples here for you. And we're gonna pretend we're an Italian restaurant. And we're gonna do risotto. We're gonna do bruschetta or bruschetta for all you Italians at home, calamari. And of course, mozzarella sticks for the kids and me at midnight. All right. So our risotto comes in and I, I you know, use these off actually, believe it or not, I use these off a, a costing I'd done for a customer a long time ago. Um, so this is actually real data, believe it or not. I'm just not going to divulge the name. So we have 289, whoops, we have 289 in our plate cost. We sold 534 of them. And let's pretend this is over a year and our item sell price is $10, right? That's as simple. So all of a sudden it jumps up to a star. <laughs> That's just because we don't have anything else in here yet. It's the only, the only uh, item. So then for our bruschetta, we sold 899 of those in a year. Uh, we got 2.27 in the plate and we have six bucks in the sell price. Calamari, two, four, three, five, very popular dish, obviously. It's a plate cost. And then we have $9 as our selling price. So now the spreadsheet's populated, right? And, and again, this is a very rudimentary experiment, but it's important to understand down here how you have op entrees, appetizers, soups, and salads. You need to compare these items on the quadrants. You can't compare a calamari to your strip steak. It's uh -huh. not a fair comparison because the calamari is a $12 dish. The strip steak's a $35 dish. The gross profits are going to be so spread out. It's comparing apples to oranges. So you got to compare entrees to entrees, appetizers to appetizers, soups to soups, and desserts to desserts, that sort of thing. And so that's why we have the different tabs at the bottom here. So we're in the appetizer, we're in the entree tab, but it should be in the appetizer tab, no worries. We can always rename that. So we put in all our like items here, all our appetizers, we put in our numbers sold, blah, blah, blah. And then the spreadsheet generates these. We get a challenge, we get a dog, we get a star, and we get a workhorse. So the mozzarella sticks are a workhorse. They're mm -hmm. good probably as is. Now you can tweak the price a little bit to try to make them stars, but I would probably recommend leaving these as is. The people like them, the people like the price point. You got a decent amount of profitability, high popularity, let them drive the bus and serve as your, your foundational margin coming in. Well, and also how much, how, how much labor goes into that workhorse? Very yeah, little, yeah. You drop it in the deep fryer, yeah. uh, unless you, you have some specialty ones that you, you make yourself, but you know, it's probably something you, you buy frozen. Right. And, and you bring up a very valid point, which we'll discuss in a couple of minutes. So um, the calamari is a star. It's got high popularity, high gross profit. Don't touch it. Can you, can you squeeze a little more profit out of this? Maybe, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is the epitome of what your menu item once needs to be. I would leave it alone. When I look at my bruschetta, I say, oh my God, it's a dog. I'm going to get rid of it. I don't know why it's a dog. Maybe I should look into it as you suggested earlier. I, and, and certainly I definitely would because this bruschetta, I already have bread on my menu. I already got tomatoes on my menu. I already got basil on my menu. I don't have a ton of labor into this. It's dovetailed nicely. I really want this dish to work. Is there something I can do with this to make it work? So I'm at this crossroads now. Do I drop it or do I try to make it work? Chances are I'm going to drop it, but I'm going to at least give it its due diligence a time to look at it and see if I can improve it. Sometimes just raising the price a little bit is all you need to do. And it puts it in a different quadrant. You'll notice the popularity won't be affected. Your prior profitability goes up. And all of a sudden it falls into that workhorse category that we can accept. And then you have the challenges. And this is the ones that, these, these are the fun ones for me because they're a puzzle. It's like a little Rubik's cube. You got to figure out why it's not working because you want it to work. It's got the high profitability, the popularity is not there. And this is one where I maybe pull my staff and figure out what they think about it. I taste it with them to get their insight. I'm very, very big on collaboration with these people because as a chef, I'm not really close to the consumer as far as taste preferences. I try to be the service staff is right in the middle of me and the customer. They are more like the customer than I am, but they still understand me. And so I think they're a great sounding board and, and a great um, focus group for trying menu items and, and getting honest feedback. And hopefully I, you know, they feel comfortable being honest with me. But that's what I'm doing to, to figure out this challenge and figure out how I can make it better to turn it into a star or a workhorse, one of the two. But that's essentially it on, on this part of menu engineering. I mean, you can see it's, it's not rocket science. And it's really just simple data. One simple word determines your action on exactly what you do with each of these items. And again, the dogs are gone, the stars leave alone, and the workhorses probably leave alone, and the challenges, let's, let's get them up to stars. But you can see how there's very little emotion. I'm not doing any gut shots. I'm not basing it only off one dimension. It's much more thorough and comprehensive than just a normal analysis that we normally do in restaurants. And again, if you have your menu, cost it out. It doesn't take too much time to put this in, man. Share that on the website as well, along with a menu costing template that I have here. And I've created this and emptied it out so operators could use if it ever pop up on my Mac. 
I put an example in there of the bruschetta so everybody could see kind of what's going on and how to use it. But again, I have bottom tabs here, sandwiches, entrees, salads, flatbread, so on and so forth. And then you put your menu item here, the ingredients here, recipe amount, you know, your units, your case cost, you do your calculations and you put in your cost per unit. Certainly if anybody needs help with this, I'd be happy to walk them through their top five or 10 menu items. They just got to email me and get them in the routine. And then I think they could probably take it from there because it's not overly difficult. It's just a little tedious. But again, once you get it done once, man, you're good. You're set, set for life almost, right? Well, and it kind of goes into what we talked about last week. You know, you, you do the push-ups, you put in the work, and this is something that will continue to provide benefit for the next 12 months, the next 24 months. I mean, these are things that do, do it now, do it quickly, and you have it behind you, and now you can use it as a resource time and time again. Yeah, 100%. And so there's one other caveat to this. So the, the costume form I showed you was probably more for your family restaurants or you know, kind of all inclusive middle tier restaurants, right? Like kind of the bread and butter of our industry, quite honestly. But for the fine dining people, I have a soft spot because that's where I came from. When you change your menu eight, nine times a year, doing the menu costing behind it is almost not worth the time. It, it becomes like the minute you're done with the costing, you're ended up just changing your menu again anyway to reflect seasonality and trends, right? Because it's usually how fine dining works. So I developed this sheet. And it's just a center of the center of the plate costing sheet. It's a quick costing through. So if you don't want to take the time to cost out your entire menu, you can use this sheet and it's relatively accurate. It's not as accurate as a full, a full costing. But the nice thing about this is I can get this whole sheet done for my invoices in about 15 minutes weekly. So I can keep my fingers on the pulse of exactly what I need to do. Where the variance is here is this Q factor, right? And this is, this is an estimate. This is going to change for you um, depending on your operation and what you do. But I, you know, I work in a world where I have a center of the plate. So if I'm doing lobster rolls, my lobster drives the cost of that dish. The bun, the mayonnaise, the celery, the garnish, everything else on that plate is, goes into the Q factor as well as dish detergent and sanitizers and all that jazz. That's in my Q factor. And so I just take the cost of my lobster, incorporate the yield percentage to get the true cost or the edible cost, which you can always just Google yield percentage on lobster and you'll find out that shelled live lobsters are about 40%. So you just plug that 40% in there and you're 9 dollars a pound and it spits out what your price per ounce should be, right? And so then I add my ounces per dish. I add my Q factor, which again is an estimation of the mayonnaise and the bun and everything else goes with it. And bada bing, bada boom, my costing is done. And it took me like three minutes per dish as opposed to maybe 45 minutes per dish. And again, once I have this set up, I can do this every week or have my kitchen manager do it in, in a very small amount of time. And then I can use this very data to plug into my menu engineering spreadsheet and generate the exact same results that I did with a more comprehensive costing. So this is kind of a shortcut for those who change their menu often. Again, you're missing a little bit in accuracy, but still so much better than doing nothing. This is one that I wanted to talk about with you, and we'll share this one too. Um, Brian, you mentioned you, you talked about labor and dishes, right? And the mozzarella sticks and, and having a lack of labor. This is one of the biggest mental hurdles that, mental hurdles that I think operators deal with is, is that 33% food cost. Are you familiar with this at all? Oh, a absolutely. This is... Again, this goes to one of my big pushes in 2020 is ticket average. I'd love to hear your thoughts on yeah. it. This is an example I gave, I gave someone maybe three years ago, and I, I've kept this document around just because it's, sometimes it's hard to intellectualize why it's okay to run a 50% food cost in certain items. And a lot of times we, we don't consider gross profit and we don't consider the other component of our prime costs, right? So we love prime costs around Hillcrest. You know that I love prime costs. Because I think that's the way you truly look at things. Looking at food costs and then looking at labor costs, fine for your shift management and things like that. But when you look at it from the topical standpoint, you need to have all of that one basket because it's a symbiotic function between food costs and labor costs. Um, and again, when they represent 65% of your revenue stream, you just simply cannot ignore mastering managing these costs. So this example here is why operators shouldn't always just default to the 33% food costs. Certainly you can't. Um, that's a nice target. That's what I shoot for 33%, but it's not to be all end all. And I make exceptions and I'll tell you why. If you ask most operators right now, would they rather sell their burger at 33% or a strip steak at 50%? What do you think they'd say? Oh, I mean, it, probably eight out of 10 would say the burger. Yeah. At 33% because it's 33%. Correct. But, good job, Brian. You're, you're learning, man. You're paying attention. I love this. So, Look at the price tags on these, 12 bucks and 30 bucks. Okay, 12 bucks, but I still got 33%. That's pretty amazing. But I look at it and I got $3.50 gross estimate, um, $3.50 in my labor. You know, say it takes someone 15 minutes to get this done. 
when I go over to my steak, I got the exact same labor. I, I, I would argue maybe even take a little less labor to grill a steak than it does to put together a burger, right? So now yeah. all of a sudden I'm starting to think about prime costs here and I look at my gross profit for, per dish. So yeah, I got 33% food costs, but after my food costs and my labor costs, I'm only getting four, four and a half bucks a plate. That amounts to a 62.17% prime cost, which is rock solid. Nothing wrong with that, but I'm going to have to grind real hard to build my bank account. I'm going to sell a million burgers. If I go over here to the, the steak, I look at same labor. Now my gross profit's $11.50. Oh, and by the way, my prime costs are actually less on the steak than what they are on the burger. And that's even with the 50% food cost. So that graphic right there, I think, is, is an amazing baseline and guideline. And operators really need to look at that because you need two and a half burger customers for yeah. one steak customer. So it goes to look at your ticket average. How can you increase that? Uh, you know, and whether or not, whether you are a burger place and not a steak place, you, what are the things that you can do to add on to your ticket average? Is it the truffle fries? Is it the specialty drink? Is it the, uh, the awesome appetizer, you know, to get the, get that ticket average up. But this is such a great look at, um, you know, what are your prime costs? And, you know, when you have a larger ticket item, how does that affect things? Yeah. And, and thanks for that. I appreciate the nod. Um, what it comes down to here is when you look at this, this dish and they say the gross profit is 1150. So that must mean I have what 1950 in my plate cost, right? Oh, I'm sorry, 1950, $16 in my plate cost on the steak. So an operator gets a steak and they say, okay, this steak cost me $16. I have to charge $48 for it to work. Well, guess what? Your customers aren't going to pay 48 bucks for a steak most of the time, depending <laughs> on what segment it is. So go ahead and use your 33% food cost, put it on your special board or your menu at 48 bucks and you'll watch it be a dog and you'll eliminate it from your menu in due time, right? Or it'd be a puzzle because you have a high gross profit. You'll have to eliminate it. But if you can intellectualize this at a 50% food cost, that it's okay because this gross profit down here is okay. This sales price dries up your daily sales. So as we know, labor is a function of sales. So when your sales go up, your labor goes down. So then all of a sudden your bucket of prime cost looks great and the proofs in the pudding here, we're actually less on the steak than we are the burger all in, which I think is such an important notion. And, and I hope people take a look at this because this is a hard hurdle mentally for chefs to get over. I was one of them. I, I didn't quite get it until I was almost out of the business. And then at that point I was like, oh, Eureka, my God, I've been doing things wrong. Um, but hopefully someone can use this as a resource because it's, uh, it's pretty powerful and it's spelled out pretty nicely. So Brian, the last part about menu engineering I think is important to talk about, and uh, we'll put this conversation out of its misery here soon, is a psychological piece. And I put a link in the show notes for this. There's a concept called the golden triangle. And, and it's fascinating because psychologists have studied this ad nauseum. And, and you'd think that who would study this and why, but it makes great sense. So what they say, and I don't think this is a secret to anybody. So what they say is when you look at a menu, first and foremost, you don't read it like a book. You don't start with the first word and then read through sequentially, right? You start at the top right corner, you move to the middle, and then you go to the top left corner, depending on what study you're referring to. Either way, we know there's a process involved and we know what the hot points on the menu are. So when you have an item like that strip steak that we just talked about that has a huge gross profit and has a very profound effect on your sales and a very profound effect on your prime costs and by driving down your labor, that's a dish we want to highlight. That's a dish I want to sell. I want that dish. Actually, I only want to sell that dish. We could 86 the rest of the menu and I only sell strip steaks the rest of my life. And that's absolutely great. Imagine what dream that would be a restaurant with one menu item that you just repeat all day long. It'd be awesome. I'm drifting off into a utopian restaurant world, just so you know. Um, You're on, on Restaurant Topia. So. Yeah, that's fair. That's what happens, man. That's what happens. So, uh, you know, when you look at the psychology of things, it's when you go to a corporate restaurant and they have that little bubble by the menu item and it says new with an exclamation point, that dish isn't really that new. But what that does, that draws attention to it, right? That's what it comes down to. And when you see the little brackets with the little picture on it, they do that on purpose. They want you to buy that tuna melt. That's why they put it there. It's it shouldn't be, shouldn't be a secret. And, and I don't know that it is a secret, but I don't think enough people practice it, especially in, in fine dining. We tend to just list our items and call it a day. There's no features. There's no psychology behind it. There's really no engineering that way. And, and I would recommend it to people. I mean, look, there's millions of dollars behind these studies that, that have put the proof in the pudding. The fact is they're effective. That's why you see a lot of restaurants um, incorporating these notions. And, and the psychological piece is, is harder to prove than the data piece, but just as useful. And we can't forget that our menu is our number one salesman. So the more, the more tools we equip our number one salesman with and appropriate tools, the better off we're going to be as an organization. Uh, I agree. 
No, that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Well, I think that that pretty much wraps up menu engineering for me. I, I wanted to get the data piece out of the way and I wanted to get the psychological piece out of the way. Certainly the conversation is nice, but to get this stuff done, you actually have to go through and learn it with all the resources we give you. It's not something that you can just have a conversation about and be done. However, I am always available. So anybody out there, if you're, you're interested in learning more about this or, or me helping you with this to get this off the ground, I'd be more than happy to, to come visit, to work through, get you set up with all the infrastructure needed to maintain this sort of behavior. Um, I think it would make you a better operator through and through because again, you're making more pragmatic, less emotional decisions in, on your business. And I think that's absolutely the right way to go. Thank you, Anthony. That's great information. Uh, you know, very short and to the point. So I hope operators use this as a takeaway, you know, go to our website, pull off the resources and use them in your operation. So uh, thank you so much. Any, anything to close it out, Anthony? No, I, listen, man, it's just, I, I'm grateful for everybody and, and grateful to be here, man. This is such a pleasure. I appreciate it every week, Brian. It's awesome. And this high quality pod. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Take Cut. care. Cut. Adios. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to Restaurantopia. The gratitude that we have for each and every one of you spending your precious time to listen to this podcast is immeasurable. Please make sure to tell a friend about this podcast. And also, if you have any feedback for us, visit us on restaurantopia.com and drop us a line. You can also subscribe on your favorite place to listen to podcasts. Thank you and have a great day. Business first, brother. That's why we're here. Wow. It's, 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 I tell yeah. my son, uh, you know, passing is for practice. Shoot it. <laughs> That's the mob of mentality, man. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can stop there, man. We're done. We're like, like I, can't, I can't do any better than that. We're out of here. <laughs> Dude, good form. Good form. So, all right. Well, back to the topic at hand, if I could ever get over what you just said. Um, yeah. Speaking of Dave, I miss Dave. Oh, I know. He, he added so much. He, he adds at least 40 minutes to the episode. That's what I'll say. We're a two-legged stool without him, man. We're going to fall over. Before you blow up Anthony's... Uh, inbox. Dave will be back next week.